Hello, welcome to Physics 2, Lecture 24.2, Magnetic Fields Due to Currents. A compass needle will deflect if you place it near a current carrying wire. So this is something that is a little bit more behind the scenes than what you would see with our previous lecture. So it's interesting, we have a direct connection between electric current and magnetism. When the current stops, uh, a compass will go back to its original orientation, typically north to south. So this is telling us quite clearly that there is an electric current producing a magnetic field. In other words, when you turn the current on, you get um, a deflection in your needle. When you turn it off, it goes back. Something is happening there. And so the field lines due to currents technically have no start or end. In other words, they form complete circles or at least closed curves. Now that seems kind of counter to what we were talking about in our previous lecture because we said that magnetic field lines start on a north pole and end on a south pole of a magnet. But technically, even in a magnet, we form completely closed loops. We just don't see that because it's within the magnet itself. And so you can see here, north to south, but once it hits the south end of the magnet, it technically goes inside the magnet and through back to the north side. So we have closed loops of magnetic field lines. So let's just look at a number of different patterns and then uh, in the rest of the lecture we're going to talk about the specifics of each of these. So let's start here uh, with a current in a long straight wire. You will form concentric circles around that wire for the magnetic field strength. And so you can see here some iron filings sprinkled around it they form concentric circles. If you have a loop of current, so a single loop, you'll get concentric circles close to the edges of that ring, um, but then they kind of form more elongated shapes as you move closer to the center, and then perfectly in the middle, you get a straight line. And you can see that again in the magnetic uh, filing uh, diagram. And then the third type of object we're gonna look at is basically a ton of loops of current uh, together, which we call a solenoid. It's a very specific type of device, which we'll look at down the road. Um, but you get a pretty uniform parallel field on the inside of this device that then loops around on the outside where it's weaker and comes back in. So notice, though, for any of these devices, we're getting closed loops all the way through them. Now, the diagram on the left I wanted to add in, just because um, here on paper you only see one ring, but technically this magnetic field exists everywhere along the length of the object. And so that's what this diagram is just trying to indicate, that you see it along all points of the object, not just in one place. So, um, again, we can use compasses to determine the direction of the magnetic field, just like we did with a bar magnet in our previous lecture. But now we're talking about loops. So it's not as easy to just say use a single compass needle and that's it. Here we're going to use multiple. So in the diagram here on the top right, we see current moving upward through the wire, and, as a result, we end up with a uh, counterclockwise pattern of magnetic field lines. Just for clarity, if you were to reverse the current and have it going downward, you would see the opposite take place. So, how do we remember our orientation of our magnetic field compared to the current? Well, we're going to introduce a very handy tool, no pun intended, because it's called the right-hand rule. So to help remember the direction, let's use this right-hand rule for fields. The steps are provided in the image on the right. So uh, to begin, take your hand and wrap it around a wire. Your right thumb, note it's a right-hand rule so it does not work with your left hand, point your right thumb in the direction of the current. In the case here, the current is moving upwards so our thumb points up. Then take your fingers and wrap them around the wire to form a circle. Your fingers are curling in the direction of the magnetic field lines. So in this, in this case, that would again be a counterclockwise direction. If, for whatever reason, you had current that was downward, then your thumb points down. Um, if you mimic this, you go in kind of gladiator style here, but um, your thumb points down, which means your fingers are then curling in a clockwise direction. So this is a very useful and simple way to always remember the direction of the field, or if you happen to know the direction of the field, then you just point your thumb in the direction of current, and you know that. So, the problem with some of this 
is that we typically need a three-dimensional view. In other words, we're trying to think three-dimensionally, but we only have a screen or a piece of paper in front of us, which is two-dimensional. So how do we indicate, I mean, for example, a wire coming into and out of our page or field lines coming into or out of our page? Well, anytime something is moving into the page, we use an X. For me, that is like a target or kind of a bullseye look. Uh, so anytime something's going into the page, we use X's. So if you have a magnetic field line pointing into the page or into the screen, we indicate it with a bunch of different X's. If you have current going into the page, well, here's our current carrying wire. Think of this as like an edge on view of a wire. So the circle here indicates the outside of the wire and then an X pointing into it so that we know current is moving into the page or the screen. On the other hand, for uh, magnetic field lines or current coming out of the screen or page, we use dots to represent that. So any magnetic field lines coming out of this page will be a bunch of dots or current coming out of the wire will be a dot in the middle of the wire. So this is all stuff that you'll just become more familiar with over time. I will say the three dimensional views onto a two dimensional diagram can become very confusing as you're about to see. So let's take a straight piece of wire and now bend it into a loop. Well, let's look at it in two different perspectives. First of all, on the left hand side of this diagram, let's look at it from the edge on. In other words, there is a loop here, um, but we have current going into, or I'm sorry, coming out of the top here and going down into the page here. So we can still use the right hand rule to figure out the direction of the magnetic field. And notice again that the field lines are stronger or closer together near um, the actual loop. That indicates that we have a stronger field closer to the device and it gets weaker as you go further away. Now notice we said previously that for a long straight wire we get a circular pattern and you do see that here. But again as you move further and further away it moves into more of say an elliptical sort of shape. Well if we look at the same circle from the side view or face on it looks a little bit crazier because now we're thinking three dimensionally and having to use X's and dots. So imagine again using the right hand rule. So take your hand and mimic what the person in the diagram is doing. The current in this loop is moving in a uh, counterclockwise direction. So at the top, your thumb should be pointing to the left, which means your fingers curl into the loop out of the screen inside. So everywhere inside the loop, your fingers are pointing out of the page or out of the screen, which means we see dots there. It's a field pointing outward. However, if you imagine somehow wrapping your hand all the way around so that your fingers curl back into the board or page, you see a bunch of X's on the outside. So it takes some time to become familiar or at least comfortable with this three-dimensional diagram, uh, but sit with it for a little while and practice it to become familiar. You'll see this on lots and lots of different diagrams down the road. Again, if we were to reverse the direction, the diagram really doesn't change a whole lot. All of the directions just flip. So we would see instead of a counterclockwise direction here, it would switch to clockwise. And over here, we would basically swap our X's and dots. So uh, we've looked at straight wires, we've looked at loops, there was one other device that we were looking at, and that is a solenoid. Now, just as a point of reference, uh, the most common or easily related to a uh, solenoid is an MRI system that is used in hospitals, for example. That is basically a giant solenoid. Uh, what you have inside of that device, inside of the nice plastic casing, is a giant loop of wire. And so... The reason we use a device like this is it produces a very uniform magnetic field, meaning a field that has the same strength and the same direction at every single point. So of course that would be important if you're trying to use this on a human, you put a human in the middle of it in an MRI machine, you don't want a wildly varying magnetic field that could cause a lot of problems. So what we see is a fairly uniform field. And so the device that we use is called a solenoid. Um, and so what that is, is just a really long coil of multiple loops of wire, like you see here at the top, with current passing through, and it's the same everywhere throughout. It's just one loop, so of course you have the same current. 
And again, the reason this is so helpful is it creates a uniform field inside. So imagine this being a giant MRI machine and you laying inside of it, you get a nice uniform magnetic field. What's particularly good about it is it's a fairly strong field on the inside and then a, a fairly weak field on the outside. That makes sense. As you're inside, you need a strong magnetism to um, show you the patterns in your body. And for people on the outside, you don't want to be exposed to this for um, repeated, uh, let's say, experiments or um, detections. So um, it's a lot weaker on the outside to make it at least a little bit more safe for the person out there. Uh, and so this can be really useful. So our goal now is to start putting a mathematical model to all of this. Sure, we've been talking about magnetism and mag magnetic fields for quite some time now, but, I mean, it's physics, come on, where's the math? So let's step through each of these three objects once again, but this time expressing it mathematically. So to begin, uh, we start with the basic units. In SI units, the unit of a magnetic field is typically measured in Tesla, given by the capital T symbol. Sometimes it's also measured in Gauss, um, but if we need to, I'll introduce that down the road. As a point of reference, uh, this is similar to current in the sense that usually we analyze very, very small values for magnetic field strength. For example, a MRI machine, which as many people are familiar with, has a very strong um, magnetic field. It's only one Tesla. So one Tesla is actually a very large number. In fact, the world's strongest possible magnet that we have is around 45 Tesla. Um, so that just gives you perspective. Um, I just bring that up for reference down the road. So if you're getting things that are like hundreds of Tesla, there's either a problem with what you did, or um, we're talking about some extreme, possibly even theoretical object. So let's kind of recap. We saw in previous discussions that magnetic field lines form circles around a wire. Meaning, mathematically, we should see something related to a circle, which we'll see in a moment. The field also gets weaker with distance from the wire, so the further away from the wire you get, the weaker it gets, which means we should see something over R in an equation. And also, the field strength is directly related to current, so it makes sense. The more current you run through the device, the stronger the magnetic field produced. So, combining all of this together, we have our first equation for magnetism. Oh, there it is. Uh, it is the magnetic field strength for a long straight wire. It is given by the equation B equal to mu naught I over two pi R. So first of all, recognize that I is current. It's directly related to current. More current means more field strength. But it's inversely related to the distance from the wire. The further away you get, the weaker it gets. And notice the 2 pi r here, that's indicating the circular nature of these field lines. The only thing that we haven't discussed is what mu naught is. We're not going to go into detail on this, it's just another constant that we use. We call this the permeability constant, and this mu naught value is equal to 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 tesla meters per ampere. Again, let's not dig too far into that, it's beyond the scope of our, our discussions but it is a value you will use in many, many equations down the road. Now, this is just for a single magnetic field um, produced by a single wire. A lot of times you have multiple wires in a region, and so you have to find the total magnetic field. Well, just like we've seen many times in the past, if you want to find the net or total magnetic field at any point, it's simply the vector sum of each individual field at that point. In other words, Let's say you have two wires, find the magnetic field strength from each wire, and then just add them together, and that gives you your total. All right, well, next up, we looked at current loops. So the magnetic field due to a loop is actually pretty complex. Um, it's different in different parts of the object, so it could be weaker further away, stronger as you get closer. Uh, so it's, it's a very complicated system, and there's no way to come with come up with one single equation to define all of it. However, we can come up with a simple expression for the field at the exact center of the loop. Because the loop is simply a wire bent into a circle, the equation is very similar to that of a straight wire. So the magnitude of the field at the center 
is given by mu naught i over to capital R. Capital R here being the radius of the loop. Big point of confusion with students. In the previous equation, it was small r, that is the distance away from the wire. Here, capital R is the radius of a loop. It's pretty confusing. Uh, again, it just comes with practice, to, um, be getting familiar with this. And again, I'm putting the words on the side to make sure you don't use the wrong equation for a problem. So this equation only works for a loop of radius r. Sometimes you might have multiple loops, so maybe you have two or three loops, a few more, um, n number of loops. Well, it's basically just multiplying the field strength. So if you have two loops, it's twice the field strength, five loops, five times the strength, and so on. So if you happen to have multiple loops, you simply add in n into your equation, where n is the number of loops or turns in your coil. So that equation ends up being mu naught n i over 2 pi r. Okay. Uh, oh, hang on, let me double check. Uh, I actually apologize, the bottom of the equation, very, very formal of me here. Uh, this is supposed to be over two capital R. Um, so forgive that mistake, so big heads up. Again, this is two capital R here. It's supposed to be the same as this equation above, just times N. Uh, so I forgot to change this on the bottom, uh, my apologies. Okay. The last type of device we looked at was a solenoid. So in the case of a solenoid, it's a little bit different. Uh, the equation still has the same general structure, um, but we see something interesting happen. Um, so let's say we have a solenoid of length L, and again, N turns of wire. By definition, a solenoid is a bunch of turns of wire, so that makes sense. Well, the field will increase in strength if you pack more turns of wire inside. In other words, if you um, wrap it up more and more, you'll have a stronger field. Well, further, you would expect that the strength of the field is directly related to the current as well. So just like in our previous equations, we should see the current appearing on the top of our equation. In other words, the numerator. But what's kind of unique here, or interesting, is that you don't actually see a dependence on the radius or the size of the, um, of the solenoid, um, it, its diameter or radius, that is. That's because we have a uniform field on the inside. In theory, the field should be the same everywhere as you move up or down the object. So it technically doesn't matter if you're right at the center, uh, you know, a quarter of the way through, right along the edge. In theory, it's a uniform field, so, it's a, so it should be the same everywhere. So we actually don't see a radius uh, term in this equation. Um, so we have mu naught n i, just like before, but on the bottom, instead of having a radius dependence, it's only dependent on the length of the solenoid. So uh, this next slide just summarizes everything we just talked about uh, into one big picture. So on the left, we have a straight wire, in the middle, a coil or a loop, and on the right, we have a solenoid. It gives you each equation and breaks it down into parts uh, to help you get more familiar with it. And it again reiterates the fact that you can use the right hand rule for any of these devices to figure out the direction of either the current or the magnetic field as long as you know one or the other. So uh, this is more of a reference slide. I'm not going to go through all of it again uh, right here in the lecture. So what we are going to do now uh, is go through some example problems. This is the first time I've ever done handwritten examples in a lecture video, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but let's go ahead and work out some examples. Note I changed the background just so it's a single color, so it's easier to read. So our first example is going to be actually one of our longer ones for this video. What we're going to do is look at the situation in the top right where we have two long and straight wires that lie parallel to one another. They're each carrying a current of 5 amps, but notice that they're in opposite directions. The top wire um, has a current to the left, the bottom wire has a current to the right. The problem asks for the strength of the magnetic field at the point P, which you see at the top. So this is going to be an interesting problem, and the very first thing I am going to do is actually draw this uh, diagram again, but viewed from the edge on. In other words, imagine taking these two um, wires and rotating them 90 degrees so they're pointing into and out of the screen. So I'm going to quickly make a coordinate axis here. Uh, I'm not great with straight lines, so I apologize. 
So just set up a standard X and Y coordinate grid. And I'm going to place wire 2 at the origin. Wire 2, let's say, has a current coming um, out of the page. We then have wire 1 with a current going into the page. I'll write wire 1 and 2 here. And bear with me, this might be a little bit slow um, as I get used to this diagram, uh, or drawing these diagrams. And then we have some point P up at the top. So this is important. We're looking for the field at the point P. Uh, so let's go ahead and analyze what's happening here. So we should have a electric, or excuse me, a magnetic field from each wire acting on this point. So we have to use our right hand rules to figure out what's happening here. Wire one has a current going into the page or into the screen. So take out your right hands, point your thumb into the page and wrap your fingers around this wire. At the top where P is, our fingers are pointing toward the right. So we should see a magnetic field pointing to the right because of wire one. We'll call this B1. Well, wire 2 is also creating its own magnetic field at point P, but this time the current is coming out of the page. So take out your right hands with your thumb pointing out of the page and wrap your fingers around, and when they get up to the point P, your fingers should be pointing to the left. But the distance is further away, so we should see a weaker magnetic field. In other words, a smaller arrow. Okay, it's a little bit sloppy, but hopefully you get the idea. So, let's start to look at the mathematical side of this. Um, so let me pull up the yellow ink again. Uh, I would like to use white, but I haven't figured out how to get that yet. So let's do um, the mathematical side of this. Our goal is to find the total or net magnetic field at point P. To do this, we're going to solve for the magnetic field of B1 and the magnetic field of B2 at that point, and then add them together. So let's jump right into this. So for B1, we use the equation, since this is a long straight wire, mu naught i over 2 pi r. So we have 2 pi r. Um, we know the permeability constant is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 tesla meters per amp. And we know the current in these wires is 5 amps. We divide this by the 2 pi r, where r is the distance from the wire. So we'll have to figure this out. So the distance from wire 1 to point P is given as 8 centimeters. Uh, in other words, 0 0.08 meters. If we plug this into our calculators, unless you're some genius and can solve this in your head somehow, we should get 1.25 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. Again, I'm really sorry if this is sloppy. Hopefully it gets better with time. So that's B1 at point P. Let's now solve for B2. The equation is of the same form, mu naught i over 2 pi r. But this time we just have a slightly different setup. We still use the same constant, 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 Tesla meters per amp. And even though it's a different wire, they both have 5 amps, so we use, again, 5 amps. We divide this by 2 pi r. This is where the difference comes in. The second wire is twice as far away. In other words, twice uh, 0 0.08 meters is 0.16 meters. So we're actually dividing our overall value in half from B1. So this will give us 0 0.63 times 10 to the minus 5. So we have now found the magnetic field of B1 at this point and the magnetic field B2 at this point. So how do we know the total? We add them up. Let's say we take the total as B. So we'd have B1 plus B2, the vector sum. Now, we have to be very careful about this because direction matters. 
Looking at the second diagram that I made, the red arrows, B1 is pointing in the positive x direction, in other words to the right, while B2 is pointing in the negative x direction, uh, um, in other words to the left. So we should see that B2 is a negative value. So B1 is 1.25 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla plus a negative 0 0.63 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. This will give us our solution of 0 0.63 times 10 to the minus 5. And that there is our answer. So this is our first example dealing with magnetic field values. Here we're dealing with two uh, straight lines. So we're using the equation mu naught i over 2 pi r. To find the total, you do the vector sum. So we find b1, b2, and then add them together. Uh, hopefully that uh, works out for you. If you have any questions, just let me know. OK. Let's move into our second example. This example says green turtles are thought to navigate by using the dip angle of the Earth's magnetic field. To test this hypothesis, green turtle hatchlings were placed in a 72 centimeter diameter tank with a 60 turn coil of wire wrapped around the outside. A current in the coil created a magnetic field at the center of the tank that exactly canceled the vertical component of the Earth's 50 tesla field. Uh, it's another mistake, that should say 50 micro tesla. Let me put that in there. 50 micro tesla field. At the location of the test, the Earth's field was directed 60 degrees below the horizontal, and it asks what was the current in the coil. So there's a few things going on here. We have two different magnetic fields this time to worry about. And it says something important. They exactly cancel the vertical component. So this is key. It's <laughs> not the straightest line I've ever made. So we're trying to cancel the two components. In other words, we should say that the sum of them together is equal to zero or that they're equal to the inverse of one another. So we first have the magnetic field of the Earth. So let's call it B subscript Earth. It's given as 50 microteslas, but as the diagram shows, or as the problem states, it's oriented 60 degrees um, from the loop. So what we're going to need to do is figure out the component of this. So we want to know the component of this magnetic field line that is vertical. So we need to figure out the vertical component of it. In other words, we have a little right triangle that forms here, and we need to use trig. If we want to find the vertical component, or the y component of this, we multiply by the sine of the angle. So we take the original value, oh boy, b earth, and then multiply that by the sine of the angle. We're using sine, uh, if you recall, because we are using the opposite side and the hypotenuse. If you remember Sokotoa, opposite hypotenuse is sine. So this will give us um, 50 micro tesla, which is 50 times 10 to the uh, minus 6 tesla, times the sine of 60 degrees. This will give us 4.33 times 10 to the minus 5. So that is the vertical component of the Earth's field. Now, that is supposed to perfectly balance the uh, magnetic field of the coil. So now that we know the field of the Earth, well, the field of the coil has to be the same. It's telling us that they are exactly canceled. So uh, that will give us 4.33 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. And again, I know this value is the same because the problem states that they exactly cancel each other out. So they have to be the same, pointing in opposite directions. Now, the problem asks for us to figure out the current in the coil. So we're talking about a coil or a loop. So let's pull in that equation. 
our equation for the magnetic field strength of a loop was mu naught times n times the current over 2 capital R. Our goal is to solve for the current, so we have to rearrange this equation to solve for I. So to do that, I'm going to multiply 2R to the other side and then divide by mu naught n. Uh, so we should see something like uh, the following. 2RB over mu naught times n. Just a little bit of algebra there. At this point, we should be able to plug in our values. Uh, 2 is just 2, big surprise there. R, again, is the radius of the coil. Uh, we were told it's a 72 centimeter diameter, which would be a 0 0.36, oops, 0 0.36, what happened? 36 uh, meter uh, radius. The field strength, which we just solved for, was 4.33 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. And we divide this by the permeability constant, oh boy, straight lines, uh, times the number of turns. The constant is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6. And the number of turns uh, was given in the problem as 60. Note that that doesn't have a unit, it's just a number. So solving this, we will get 0 0.41 amps. And that's our solution. So we now know the current that they used in the coil um, for this experiment. Again, still working out my uh, kinks here with uh, my handwriting and hopefully I can learn how to make a straight line at some point. Uh, okay, so that's our second example. Let's do one more example. Uh, we looked at one using a straight line or a straight wire. We've done one now with a loop. So let's use our third device, a solenoid. The problem states a typical MRI solenoid has a uh, length of about one meter and a diameter of about a meter as well. A typical field inside such a solenoid is about one Tesla, which again is pretty large. So the problem asks how many turns of wire must the solenoid have to produce this field if it's carrying 100 amps? Well, first of all, we're talking about a solenoid. So let's bring in the equation of a solenoid. That is mu naught ni over the length L. We're told to solve for the number of turns. And so we need to rearrange this expression for n. I multiply L to the other side and divide by mu naught i. So we should end up with LB divided by mu naught times the current i. This problem is a little bit simpler than the previous ones. All we have to do is kind of plug and chug at this point. Um, we have a length of one meter times a magnetic field strength of one Tesla divided by our constant 1.26. Sorry about that. Here we go. Times 10 to the minus 6. And the current, which was given to us as 100 amps. So if we plug all this in, we should end up with about, this is uh, I think an estimate, but uh, 8,000 turns. So there's about 8,000 turns of wire inside of this MRI machine, assuming you know we're just using standard values. So it's kind of neat to think about this. You don't actually see the inside of the device, but you can estimate how many uh, loops of wire are inside of it. So in a really nerdy way, I think that's kind of cool. Okay, we've done an example of all three different equations. Let's finish up this lecture with some quick check questions. If you were in a face-to-face -face class with me, these would be Kahoot questions or clicker questions. Um, so the way it's going to work here is I will present the question to you. Um, what I recommend is pausing on the screen whenever I ask the question so you can think about it and try to come up with your own answer. And then on the next slide, I will reveal the answer. So here is our first one, quick check 24.7. The problem states, a long straight wire extends into and out of the screen, as you see on the right. The current in the wire is blank. So use the compass directions given to figure out your answer. I'd pause the video, think about it, and then start the video again when you're ready. 
All right. Well, the answer here is going to be B out of the screen. We simply have to use the right hand rule. Notice that the compass needles are moving in a counterclockwise direction. So by the right hand rule, take your fingers, move them in a counterclockwise direction, which forces your thumb to point out of the screen with a dot. The answer is B. Next up, point P is five centimeters above the wire as you look straight down at it. So we're looking at a top down view. P is five centimeters above it. In which direction is the magnetic field at that point? Pause the video, use your right hand rule, and come back when you're ready. Okay. Well here, again, right hand rule, we're given the current direction, which is to the right, so our thumb has to point to the right. We curl our fingers around the wire, and when we get above the wire, our fingers are pointing downward. It's really hard to do this without showing you in person, but just try to envision this, that your fingers are curling downward when you're on top of the wire, which is the answer D in this case. Next, the following diagram shows a current loop perpendicular to the page. So that's a loop that you see in the diagram. Uh, the view is a slice through of the loop, so you can see the current going out of the page at the top and into the page at the bottom. The direction of the current in the wire at the top is, and bottom is shown, I just said that. Uh, so what is the direction of the magnetic field at the center of the loop? Okay, well again, try to apply your right hand rule. The answer is to the right, and you can get this twice. Uh, you can figure out your answer twice. Let's start at the top. At the very top, we have a current coming out of the screen, so our thumb points outward, which means our fingers curl around that wire, and when we get to the bottom where the dot is, our fingers are pointing to the right. We can also get the answer by looking at the bottom. At the bottom, we have a current going into the page, or into the screen, so our thumb points inward, and again, our fingers wrap around, and when we get up to the top, our fingers are also pointing to the right. So either way, we get the same result. Last uh, quick check for this lecture. Two solenoids um, are shown. Solenoid number two at the bottom has twice the diameter, twice the length, and twice as many turns as the one at the top. How would you compare the two fields? Okay, so they're actually the same. Even though it's twice as much for everything, if you recall the equation for a solenoid, uh, which, if I let's see, you can still write here, B was equal to mu naught ni over L. So we are doubling uh, the length, so we're basically putting a 2 here, but we're also doubling the number of turns. Note it says you double the diameter, but notice the equation doesn't depend on diameter at all, that's irrelevant. So if we double the turns and we double the length, well, we're doubling something on top, doubling something on bottom, those cancel each other out, and we're back to the original statement. So we end up with the same magnetic field strength, even though it seems a little counterintuitive just by looking at the two devices. Okay, uh, so that's it for this lecture. Um, it's a lot longer than our first lecture, of course, since that was an introduction. Here we actually introduced equations, examples, and quick check questions. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Otherwise, as always, thanks for watching, and have a great day.